Um, we're looking at the, the super drawings in 3D that we have. Um, we think we're looking at uh, one of the, the um, Type 89 uh, 12.7 centimeter guns. All right. Wait yeah. For uh, or, wait a minute. Stand by. Yeah. I just don't see any of those circles. So um, or it could be the 12 centimeter um, uh, Nendo Shiki gun mount. That was what was scheduled. That's what she had. Uh, she was scheduled to be replaced with the Type 89 one uh, 12 or 7 centimeter after Midway. So obviously that didn't happen. So we're probably looking at a 12 centimeter. Uh, Nindo Shiki gun mount. Thank you, short team. So it's 12 inch or 12 centimeter any aircraft gun. Did you get that, Nautilus? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, I'm looking at. I'm just trying to figure out this circular gun tub. Um, And where where on the ship that was? Is that right? I think so. This is Mike. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm not speculating where we are. Just that heading. If we go that way, it's that heading, and if we go that way, it's that heading. Yeah, 20 yeah. or 200. 20 or 200. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Nautilus, short side. Yeah, we hear you. Everybody, gather around the plants here. It's evolving into a sense that you are just at, uh, you're in the area of the stack. Uh, and laterally right across from the uh, center line midship elevator where the bomb would have hit. Uh, so you look like from the starboard side of the... Uh, so you think we're, we're starboard, but we're slightly aft of the stack? Yes. There's a, looking at the drawing we have, there's a, a kind of a distinctive curvature to the, uh, to the deck, which seems to match what we're looking at here. Yeah, this is we cut into it all the right. Yeah. All right, that's that's a good start. Thanks, guys. And you can see the elevator on the second. Yeah, and the elevator is showing up in the sector scan, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that can confirm it. Oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, we can come wide. Are we full wide? No, go ahead, Jana, full wide, please. Um, I think, uh, if you guys are ready, we can lateral to the, to the right, come which currently our theory yet to be proved wrong, uh, would be that this is the starboard side and we'll be moving, uh, forward. Our top scientists say 30 meters at 200. Zero, zero. Roger. All right, I just put in a uh, set for 
three zero meters going at a bearing of two zero zero. Red job. And for any of our viewers uh, who are not as familiar with nautical terminology, uh, starboard side is the right side when you're facing the front of the ship, port is the left, the bow is what we would call the front of the ship, and the stern is the back of the ship. Thanks, Jim and, and John and others at uh, uh, at Silver Spring. I, I see what you're talking about. That's kind of what we were looking at as well. Um, I'm just not entirely sure that th this gun tub is big enough to be those, but I think we, we'll find out in a minute um, if, if, in fact, we are going to see the stack soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just to clarify, Mike, is the gun tub, yeah. um, is that structured to hold up the gun? Does it also hold ammo? What is the function of the gun tub? Uh, I think, I mean, it's mostly for, um, you know, where people would stand around it to arm and fire it. Um, the ammunition was kept, uh, I think, back in the ship, but, but nearby. Gotcha, thank you. Well, if we see something that looks like the position of the stack to the right, then that'll confirm it. Yeah, for sure. And that could be diagnostic, too. Yep. And the, um, the width of the stack is, is uh, bigger on this one than the other two, so that'll help as well. The uh, Soryu had two stacks. Kaga had a, a thinner stack, and then Akagi has the big, wide one. How wide? Hmm. Good question. Those red returns on the sonar there, it's hard to say. If, but, uh, well, but it's it's actually sticking out uh, from the flight deck. Um, it, we have a, a printout of, of the plans up there for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we've been looking at them. Yeah, okay. Uh, Hans, Mike, could you explain what you mean by stack also, what feature that is and the purpose for it? Yeah, it's a, it's a smokestack, basically a chimney uh, that vented the, uh, the exhaust from the, from the engine. Uh, on Yorktown, that was the first thing that we saw when we came down on the wreck yesterday, and that was sticking straight up uh, behind the bridge. This one is actually to the side underneath the flight deck and vents it out to the side and down towards the water. It's, it's actually, there's a couple of photos online of it. Uh, in in progress of venting, and it's it's actually kind of a cool sight. Normally, you you think of chimneys as straight up and venting to the to the sky, but it kind of blew it out to the side. Hmm, interesting. Thank you. Well, it must be uh, the power plant in in the car. What engines did it have? Dan, you're really quiet. I don't know if you heard that question. Oh, my question was about the engines, the power plant for the vessel, for the carrier. Maybe some of our team in Silver Spring can help with that one. Or uh, some of our colleagues ashore. What do we know about the engine of these carriers? 
Were they still using oil-fired boilers at that point, or diesel-fired boilers? It's uh, oil-fired oil -fired boilers uh, uh, powering a uh, steam-generating turbine. Mm -hmm. Nautilus, this is Shoreside at Silver Spring. We're just conferring amongst ourselves on what we're seeing right now and also doing some texting with some other onshore folks. Okay, yeah, we're, so, we're kind of doing the same, um, reviewing all of our various materials here yeah and we're still going on that ship movement so yep. unfortunately it's going to be slow but hopefully that gives you time to orient yourself no we agree and we appreciate that thank you it's, as we're moving along uh, I you know we're beginning to see you know the, the beginning of the ship central column almost like a uh, toadstool so if we have a when we ever have an opportunity to get lower we might be able to uh, to see that feature yeah while we're doing the ship move are you guys comfortable dropping down a meter or two certainly taking a look on, at the underside of this gun mount I'm just going to uh, look down while I do that. Just, yep. Uh, uh. In answer to your question, Dan, uh, the Kagi had four steam turbine sets, and they were powered by 19 boilers. 19. That's random. She could make us, the vessel could make a speed of about 32 knots. You're really quiet, Hans. Sorry. Flying speed was about 32 knots for the vessel. Thank you. That's much better. I was trying to think of a, an analogy last night to help viewers understand how long it takes for Atalanta to move as we put in a movement. And I was thinking of if you ever go to those gyms and you see those big ropes that people manipulate on the floor and they kind of make that wave pattern towards the end and it takes a while. So we have a 5,345 meter cable. <laughs> so if you think about how, you know, it takes a while for that movement to go through that that rope or cable, that's what's happening as we call in a, uh, a movement for the ship, and the ship moves, and then after some time, uh, Atalanta will follow. Thanks for that great analogy, Mia. You're assuming I ever go to the gym. <laughs> I never go to the gym. I'm always mapping. I don't have time. I'm just, uh, I think we're just a little bit close for comfort to drop below that tub. Yeah, roger that. There, yeah. there'll be other ones we can check out to get yeah. the uh, mount, the mount looked at. I agree with you on that. And just to clarify, if I'm understanding this right, Mia. Um, basically, the ship has to move a little bit to move um, Atalanta over to where we want to see the wreck. Um, Atalanta does have some ability to kind of move itself with its thrusters a little bit in that area, but if we really want to change its position uh, more broadly on the wreck, we need the ship to move. Is that correct? correct. By different scales of movement? 
Yeah, so correct. So the first movement we called when we were down here, we just moved 10 meter, one zero meters. And that took about, I don't know, I think it was 10 minutes. And then a little bit, uh, I should have written down the time, but we, we, I put in a call for three zero meters at 200 degree bearing. So we're heading the, towards the right um, as we're looking at it. And so that takes time. So you can see if you, the time it took to step the one zero meter, so now it's three zero, it's gonna be a little bit longer. Um, but Dan's able to move a little bit with the thrusters and he's able to move the camera around or um, up and down a bit. Um, so that's how he's able to look as we're going along to manipulate those small movements. But in order to move over quite more, it, it takes a while. And then of course, you know, um, I think when we we're on the Yorktown, we overshot a little bit when we we're trying to get around the stern and that took a long time for us to get back. Um, so it's a really, really delicate. patient, yeah. delicate yeah. dance. Wow. <laughs> Thank you and the team for coordinating that. I think the important difference is rather than having a two vehicle system with Atalanta as the down sled or tow sled and the more free swimming ROV like Hercules, which is very maneuverable, we have Atalanta on the end of a very long cable, somewhat more like a pendulum. So there's a limited ability for Atalanta to maneuver and to turn, but to transit and to get around the wreck site, that means the ship moves from the surface and 5,300 meters of cable need to slowly pull it along, hence the caution. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, five meters away from the tub, as you can see there on the sonar. I have a good image of it, so I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna drop down. Nautilus, short side. Yep. Go ahead, Jim. We have an observer. We have an observation. Go ahead, Frank. Um, the gun we were looking at, um, you know, kind of looking at the force of the explosion and fire and, and all that from the, from the damage. It appears that gun has been blown backwards and, and it's been flipped over because you can see that kind of tooth structure um, on the, that's now on the top. That's part of the, the training mechanism. It should be. Um, it should be off. It should be on the other side, or you know, it's like it's, it's been the gun has been flipped over. Right. That's what it looked like. It was unshipped from the the gun mount. Yeah. It did, yeah. From the yeah, the force of that explosion was you know that's a, a tell of that. Blew it over backwards. Wow. Yeah. So Nautilus, what we're also trying to assess is whether, or, you know, which side of the ship you are on. Yeah. So you may, if you are on port side in the direction you're heading, uh, you should, what will be interesting to see is if you encounter a second tub. Well, there, so we came down in the middle between two tubs. That's right. Yeah. So if you don't find another tub, you're yeah, that's you're either forward or aft, depending on which side. Do you follow? Yeah, we're either going to find another tub or we're going to find the stack. going this direction. I think that's the flight deck there, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Did they also have a wooden flight deck over top of metal? It, it would have been, yeah. I'm not sure what type of wood the Japanese used on, on their flight deck. Um, Kaga actually had a Kaga Consort actually had a, um, a metal plate uh, laid over the flight deck in her forward section. 
Akagi did not. Akafume or June or Randy, could you help us with that question? Do we know what type of wood was covering these decks? These are square. You might think it's square. Those are elliptical. And there's three of them on the fourth side. So they're elliptical. They're all three of them the same. So we have 12 and 12 calls in the middle. something in the in the historical just going to uh, lift up a bit here Mike there's uh, yep. the sunking uh, on the deck uh, ranged no, four and a half see that and where it was a four chips on the American vessel sorry Russ you, uh, you broke up there because you repeat that Just saying that something I'd noticed certainly in, in the uh, archival photos for Akagi is that the, the wood on the flight deck, the planking was arranged fore and aft rather than uh, athwart ships like on the American carriers. Oh, you mean um, running vertical instead of horizontal? Like lot lengthways yeah, on exactly. the deck? I thought that I thought that U.S. carriers was also lengthways. Length So I come up 10 meters, Mike, and I still get a, um, a pretty good uh, sonar target there, 30 meters away. Yeah, that's probably the stack. The other side of the ship. Yeah. The island? Yeah, the, sorry, yes, the island, which are no longer the same thing. Yeah, okay. that'd be my sense. Okay. So yeah. if we're okay. right across from it, that... i drop back down. But would mean that we should be right at the stack to our right. right. Ooh, which is very exciting. Yeah, which we really want to see, because it'll help confirm many things. You know, there's a long shot at vessel identification. We're never sure if the actual ship is the same as the plans, but on plan drawings, I've seen at the stern, the characters for the name of the ship. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they actually exist on the hull of the actual vessel. So if we make it around there and we can see the stern the aft and fantail area, uh, aft deck intact, we may have a chance to check that out. I'm not sure why there's that ramp down on the deck. That's weird. It did look like quite an incline. I'm not, yeah, I yeah. don't know about that. And we're not seeing wood on the deck either, are we? No. So you think we're on the, sorry, the starboard side? Yeah. Starboard side aft? Uh, midships. Midships. Mid starboard side midship. So we would be moving forward on the ship. So, Hans, I know um, earlier on one of our previous dives we were talking about uh, how wood is colonized by organisms that break it down sometimes like worms or mussels, but that doesn't always happen at extreme depth. Uh, so what would you be expecting to see here? The places where burned wood used to be. Mm. I think if wood was remaining, then we would, we may see some because some of those predators, you know, aren't going to have the range of this depth, but this aircraft carrier burned overnight. Right. 
and um, oh, no. so Maybe you're right. there's no telling where we might see fight deck wood. No, that's a pointy end there. Hey, Mike and Hans, I just wanted to confirm. I'm looking at the diagram here, uh, yeah. the, the top picture. We're looking at it uh, from uh, bird's eye view. Um, is the top the port and the bottom the starboard side? Uh, yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Yep. Thank you. And we should be right across from the stack, which means that that, I'm sorry, from the island, which means that the stack should be coming out towards us just to our right. Roger. That's where we are. And if it was still there, it's going to project outboard. That's something to be aware of. Around it. A little look forward now and then would be prudent. Yeah. Also, a baked good would be prudent, but this is the control van, so I don't think I can bring it in here. Yeah, but you can go eat it downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> we did used to have people bring, like, a plate of them up when we had the old control van, but I think that's a, a hard no-no the, in the new control van. You can bring whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Megan's like, yes, yeah, hard no. <laughs> don't pay any attention here. I think the uh, it's crumbly. If it's crumbly, you are that's frowned upon. And just to clarify, sorry if I'm not hearing you right, sitting right next to the fan. Um, earlier, you said right next to the stack is the island. Is that correct? Uh, no, the on this ship the stack is across from the island. Across from uh, the island. They're on opposite sides of the ship. And the stack uh, jutted out below the flight deck rather than uh, up like it did on Yorktown. Can you explain um, what the island is, what it was used for? Yeah, the island just uh, had the, the bridge and navigation uh, and lookout um, primarily. Okay, so is somewhere people could step onto this a platform and then look around for any obstacles or things in the water or something like that? Uh, no, it, it, it stood up uh, from the deck and, and housed, it was like a tower on the deck uh, that, that housed the bridge and, and other um, control points. Because uh, the rest of the ship was flat, so it was the one, the one thing that stood up from the deck. Okay, thank you so much. Hmm. Mia, are we still in the middle of a move? I think Atalanta is still catching up. Let me confirm with Dan. Hmm. I was just wondering. Is, uh, if we are swinging in, we're, yeah, I think we're getting to diminishing returns. If, uh, Probably good for another move. Mike wants to keep going. Sounding like he's itching, so itching to get to the uh, stack here. Did you hear that, Mike? Yeah. So, yeah, if you want to move some more. Yes, please. Do you want to go 3 0 again? Is that good with everyone? For a distance? Yeah. Yeah. Good with that, Dan? Yes, ma'am. Bridge, Nav. Can we step another three zero meters, continuing on the bearing two zero zero? Thank you, Bridge. I'm wondering if this gap uh, below the deck that we're looking at is where the stack was? Yeah, I was thinking that if it's possible to drop down soon, yeah, once to look we to our left and right. Yeah, because that's kind of where it should have been. And if it's not a hangar door, but uh, something that looks more. I don't like really see many hangar doors on this. Right. Not the way that th that Yorktown had. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I think their hangar decks are more enclosed. Well, it'd be a good area to inspect. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 
We're yeah, we're just a little close to yeah to drop down. When I did drop down there, I was uh, lighting up uh, parts of the ship there, just you know, two or three meters away. And uh, my concern is with the site conditions here that if we get too close, we'll could we um, we'll call in our se sediment and we'll lose uh, visibility. Could we call in our 30 meter move at a slightly uh, higher angle so it moves us a little bit away from the deck as we go? We could, yeah. The other thing we can do is do a step and then determine uh, what our offset is. Sure. Then as we move, we can drop down. But e either way will get us there. Yeah, up to you guys. I really don't get a good uh, sense of the, we want to be, I think, at least five meters away. The yeah, last, I think so. The last site we were, you know, when we were dropping down there, we were uh, usually minimum five, but average ten meters away on our sonar, and uh, we seem to get a good image, and, you know, we never uh, bumped or really disturbed the sediment. Seems to be a lot more uh, sediment here, I don't Maybe just the the side of the Yorktown was you know more sheer and there wasn't as much uh, debris. I know we were going to start our watches on and off, Mike, but this is this is way too exciting. If you don't mind. Yeah, we don't need to do that yet. Hang in there yet. Thanks. Oh yeah. yeah. You two can sleep when you hit the beach, or huh. when the vehicle hits the deck. You're not excused till then. <laughs> or you can stay up and map with me all night long. It's like a long haul truck driver. You got 20 hours ahead of you. thing we can do, Mike, when this moves complete, we can step the vehicle away and that will achieve your uh, angle because yeah, you know, okay. it takes 10 minutes to... Yep, that'll work. You can move the top quickly, but Atlanta will cut the corner. Yep. On the subject of stepping away, I'm going to for a few minutes too. Be right, right back. back. On the subject here of, of watches and, and, and shifts, um, just want to give a, a preview here. So we are going to remain on uh, on bottom if everything goes according to plan. We've got it scheduled at 7 a.m. Hawaii time. So that is plenty of time to explore this entire wreck. It'll be a three-hour ascent. Um, and then a, a quick turnaround. The next target we have is a f it'll be about a four-hour turnaround, another uh, 24-hour dive and then potentially another four-hour round turnaround and another 24-hour. So I do want to encourage all of our uh, both shore and on the ship to, to, to take the rest when they can because it's going to be an intense few days. It's uh, The weather window has opened. Uh, it looks so like we're going to have flat calm conditions here for the next three to four days. So we're going to uh, take that weather window and uh, uh, see what we can do with with four days of, of absolutely calm weather no we're gonna back to back dive are we daniel yes that's the plan so exciting awesome. you know so much so much we can learn about this ocean and i hope you all will come along with us everybody watch And for anyone who wants so to learn more about this let's particular do, uh, 10 meters 290 expedition, um, you can find more information about NA154, um, also 
uh, titled Ala Al Moana Kaiuli, meaning Path of the Deep Sea Traveler, on nautiluslive.org. Yeah, if you are watching on YouTube, I encourage you to come over to nautiluslive.org, send in your questions for the team, for our experts both onshore and uh, here on the ship. Love to hear where you're watching from, what your experience is like, uh, experience, you know, experiencing and taking in these places and learning or diving into this history with us. This is a, this is pure exploration at its finest here. We are um, here to honor these stories, and to learn about this place, uh, and really happy to have you on that journey with us. Thank you, this is Silver Spring. Russ Matthews has just noted in looking down as we are right now, you can make out the original main deck of the cruiser hull that uh, was the original configuration of Wakagi, uh, protruding beyond the, the hangar and the flight deck structure. So again, off to one side and closer to the camera, you can see the flight deck of the carrier, and below that, moving in and out of view, and now coming more sharply into view, is the deck of the, of the, 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 deck of the cruiser hull. Thank you, Shoreside. Thank you, Russ. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, sharing your expertise and letting us know what we're looking at. Um, so part of this exploration, the goals of this exploration include documenting and revealing details of these vessels and assessing their archaeological condition um, and paying tribute to all the sacrifices that took place here. But also another um, aspect is to understand these wrecks as potential deep ocean reefs. And we did have a question coming in asking if um, this wreck might have any unique biodiversity um, living in it or around it. Um, perhaps our biologist on staff, uh, Upashana, could you help explain, are any of those little white um, features that look kind of fuzzy on the, on the ship, are those anemones or are you seeing any life here? Yeah, so, so far we have been mostly seeing uh, sea anemones colonizing the shipwreck. And uh, sometimes in the past we have seen uh, wrecks over time acting as uh, a different kind of a habitat for benthic organisms to uh, utilize because it kinds it kind of uh, creates a different uh, habitat from the surrounding uh, rocky or muddy regions. But so far on this particular wreck, we haven't seen any organisms that are specific to this site and are not commonly seen in it elsewhere. But uh, if it also takes a considerable amount of time for any of these uh, benthic organisms to settle and uh, grow over such structures. So that time can be a factor. And also uh, mm -hmm. studies of the benthic community around the wreck would give us a better idea of the surrounding communities from which there can be recruits on such sites. Bupasha, could you? Be oh. wood here. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I, we were talking down here. I was going to ask if that's wood or maybe a sponge or something that took over. The yellow structures, yeah. So I'm also confused though that can be some kind of an encrusting sponge or sometimes even bacterial mats can grow because there is a lot of wooden structure in such ships. So bacterial mats can also grow and they can uh, have such uh, structures. So the more we see and if we have a better zoom then we'll have a better idea about that. Yeah, it looks like it could be wood but it's yeah, unexpected that's, to see yeah, it. That's yeah. definitely looks like fore and aft flight deck wood. Yeah. You can see the planking. Yeah, the planking. Yeah, no, I think I Mia thought. is more talking about the yellowish structures, oh, no, finger like projections extending yeah. more towards the right. Yeah. I was talking about that. Yeah, I was, well, I was talking about both, so I thought that might be plank wood, but yeah, I wasn't this sure is plank wood, if it was something that kind of took over and yeah. then kind of just formed also a similar shape as it just grew over the yeah. wood. So the plank 
more towards the left definitely looks like wood covered by a bacterial man but uh yes and we're looking at a significant amount of damage here mm -hmm. to the flight deck we're also looking at what looks like to me and uh shoreside let me know if it's correct a type 96 25 millimeter anti-aircraft gun flight deck wood But, you know, it would be nice to get lower and see if we're in the stack area. That wouldn't be below the stack. We didn't see that? Um, so just to clarify what you're saying, Hans, is that uh, structure below us with the two metal projections coming out? That's the anti-aircraft gun, you think? That's one of the anti-aircraft guns. There were 14 twin 25 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. That would be my guess. The shore side can confirm. And just for your reference, we have about three meters left in the ship movement. So then it'll take some time for Adelaide to catch up. Well. I mean, if we want to keep moving, we can keep calling in moves, right? I would say it's up to uh, Dan feeling comfortable with where Adelena is and we're in, in you guys as well. Sorry, I was uh, off SPL there. What was the question? Uh, so Mike was saying if we wanted to keep calling in movements, we could. I wanted to make sure Adelena was in a good position um, before we did that. Yep, I'm happy. You're happy? Yep. Thank you. What do you want to do? Another 10 or 30? 30? Uh, yeah, 30 is fine. 30? 30 at 200 again, I think. 30 at 200. Yes, please. Bridge, Nav. Could be going this Can way. Can we please step another three zero meters, continuing okay. on a bearing of two zero zero? Maybe. Put yes. Thank you, Bridge. Yeah. Saw that. All that. Yeah. Uh, sh Jim and, and those on shore, it's possible that we're on the uh, port side instead and we're moving aft because that would be, make sense why we saw those smaller aircraft, anti aircraft guns after the two bigger gun tubs. That looks like the stern or moving aft instead, which is possible, it's, except that we did see that bright return on the other side. Maybe it's not the, the, ta the tower after all. You're getting a whole bunch of static through your line. Yeah. Uh, plug and unplug your thing in again while you're muted. And uh, archaeology team, I know we're still figuring things out, but um, any ideas on what we're looking at here with this gridded structure with the uh, holes on the side yeah, or that white uh, pipe yeah. hooking structure? Tons of static. Uh, uh, j just hold on one sec, Kara. Sure. No. Nautilus, your side. Yeah, go Nautilus, ahead. Nautilus, your yep. side. Maybe yeah, go a, ahead. Maybe get a new. Uh, We've headset. been going back and forth and looking at all of this, and at this point, uh, what we're seeing, the gap that we just passed could very well be where the funnel was. Yeah. In which case, we are on starboard side. What you are seeing here as well, as you probably have noticed, that this is a piece of flight deck that's been bent. Yes. So this, this is a piece of flight deck that's been blown up and folded over as well, as you can see, and you can see the distortion in it. But right now, looking starboard side to shore. Anybody else? Well, just adding here that, I mean, what we may be looking at with these two mounts could be small boat mounts. It could be davits. Um, there was two small boats potentially on on this side and the other reciprocally. So if that's the case, that could confirm that it's, that it's forward and stacked. Okay, roger that. 
I think yeah. those mounts would be lower than here, though. So as we continue to move in this direction, if we're correct, we're going to encounter the bow soon. Yeah. Mike, nope. can you give us that orientation again for this ship? Which side do you think the stack is on or which side the tower is on? Just give us that high level of if this is Akagi. Yeah, so the um, the stack, which was coming out from below the flight deck and pointing downward, mm -hmm. was on the starboard side, and the tower with the bridge was on the port side, both amidships. There seems to be, uh, Mike, there's a the hole you see in the top left of the screen kind of matches the giant, uh, matches the sonar. So I think some of those returns we were seeing might have been the other side of the of the gap there. Yeah, like I think so. Like the big black area on the sonar there. The depression? Yeah. Yeah. We have about 10 meters left in the ship movement, by the way. Okay, thanks. The, uh, the, um, the flight deck, it, regardless of what we see here, uh, much of the flight deck is uh, collapsed. We could tell from the uh, side scan image, the side scan sonar image, so um, that's not a surprise. Yeah. Was the uh, the biggest portion of the fire was aft in the, in the hangar deck? Uh, no, actually, it, it was across the entire ship. The, the bomb strike was um, uh, a kind of amidships, but uh, there, were, there was ordnance across the entire hangar deck, and so the whole ship kind of yeah, was burned on fire. And, and induced in explosions after that, no doubt. The, uh, the initial fire where then half, half of the uh, half of the ship didn't have uh, fire suppression because the pumps were... Well, I think the, the pump systems were damaged. Is it possible for us to look to the left from here and even get lower and look to the left, or no, if it's if we're too close in? I can certainly look to the left, yeah. It's, uh, looking back the way we came here. Yeah. Nautilus, this is Shoreside. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Nautilus, I think this is in a... Nautilus. Thanks. Nautilus, this yes, is short side. Yes, I hear you. Right under the tractor. That's what that is. Look at it now. Nautilus, this is short side. Yeah, we hear you, Jim. Yes, go ahead. Nautilus, as we <laughs> are indeed on the carrier Akagi, we feel that 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 is what we are on, that we take a moment of silence to remember those on both sides who lost their lives in the sun. Uh, yeah, we can. And those... Yeah, go ahead. Nautilus, let's, let's take a moment of silence, please, to remember the type of site we are on. An important site, a site of great service and sacrifice and the loss of lives. So let us please just take a moment of silence. Not a short side. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. With that, yes, by, by all means. Now, with that, for those ashore, we do note that as we've been moving along and with the crews working both on shore for the variety of experts providing their, in, their, their feedback as well as the team on board Nautilus, we have confirmed, based on what we're seeing with the direct features of, 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 visible to us, 
in this initial look that we are on the carrier Akagi. What we are seeing is battle damage that comes from the loss of Akagi. As we can see, there's a portion of deck which has been flipped up due to the explosive pressures that were built up as the hangar deck burned. We have passed gun tubs that are very specifically tied to the plans of Akagi. Beneath this structure, we are actually seeing the cruiser-styled hull of the vessel as it was originally built and launched before it was modified and turned into a carrier. And, and that curvature right there is pretty elevator. Yes. Shape. It's been blown from the center line. Every 30 feet or so. Absolutely. So again, Nautilus, thank you. Shore side out. Good for another move, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Can we can we step um, slightly away from the wreck so that we're able to go up and down and look at things first? Yeah, let's do another ten. Yeah, another ten two four zero or two nine zero. Sorry. Bridge now. Can we please step another one zero meters, bearing two nine zero? Yes, thank you. Model a short side. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. We want to, we want to report that now joining us on the dive uh, as an expert ashore is author John Parshall. John is, of course, the co-author with Tony Tully of Shattered Sword, the Untold Story of the Battle of Midway, which draws heavily and, and references Japanese sources. This is the, the essential read for anybody reading this in English on the story of the Battle of Midway and the ships. John uh, is widely known and widely published in naval history circles. He's been an advisor to many of us on a variety of dives and assessments of wrecks from the Pacific War. John, welcome. Thank you very much for joining. And as John's not able to chat uh, live, but he is sending us messages on the link. And with that, uh, and with that, we're able to read those and we can relay what he's saying. He is noting, of course, with no no hangar doors, as we saw in Yorktown yesterday. Uh, that fire is trapped down below and burned uncontrolled throughout the hangar uh, as the bomb set off aircraft in the midst of being refueled. John also wants us to know that as he's watching this, he is texting. Glad to have both of you on and participating in the dive. Thanks, Jim. It's, it's great to have him uh, watching and, and advising. Thank you for joining and sharing your knowledge, John. to complain to management about that. Nautilus, this is short side team here has been discussing, and as we are moving towards what is the bow, what we would like to have you consider is as we move around and we get that bow view, one of the diagnostic characteristic features and a, an important feature to document would be, if, to see if it has survived, would be the chrysanthemum crest of the Oak. Yeah, I've, um, I, I've been showing that around where um, 
but we're, we're eager to look for that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. As we're setting up here, I just want to take a moment to uh, welcome a few of our uh, participants in the chat in the science portal. Uh, one of our most loyal participants in particular, Asako Matsumoto from the Chiba Institute of Oceanology, uh, who has been following along for many years, helping us with identifications of many corals, uh, always there in early hours, late hours, and now in particular on, on this site. Uh, Thank you so much, Osako. Along those lines of thinking about the coral and the life that might be found on shipwrecks, another question for you, Apashana. Um, does the pressure and depth and uh, the very cold water also affect um, kind of maybe a decrease in life that we see here or less biodiversity at this depth? Or on this particular wreck? Uh, I cannot say uh, direct yes or no because uh, we have seen high diversities in similar depths in various regions uh, so temperature there are various groups of organisms which are specially uh, adapted to such environments but unless we have a better idea of the surrounding uh, faunal diversity it is difficult to answer that question because nutrient availability is also an important factor which is not necessary yes depth is a factor but we also have we know about several habitats at similar depths where we have high faunal diversity so it depends on a particular location and unless we uh, know thoroughly what are the organisms and the kinds of organisms found around this particular area then un without that we cannot confirm gotcha so it sounds like you're kind of comparing the wreck to nearby areas around the wreck is yeah, what you because the recruits do. and the settlements generally uh, are a factor of the water current, the surrounding, uh, the surrounding habitats, and surrounding communities from which the neo recruits will come from and settle. Or depends on the direction of the uh, water current that will be bringing those recruits right. from farther away. So there are several factors in play. Right. And we had another viewer ask about the material of the ship, if that would affect it. Like, for example, iron is a micronutrient um, that plankton need, not that um, we have much phytoplankton here at this depth, there's no light, but is that another factor, like yes. the metals involved? Yes, the, uh, the material of the ships can definitely affect the settlement With and another ten, uh, 290, uh, the kind of organisms which are found on such structures. Gotcha. Thank I you. Mm -hmm. I'll try 10 290 and see what happens. Can we step another one zero meters continuing the bearing 290? Thank you.
Mike, can you share with us what we think we're looking at right now? Uh, I think we're looking at, uh, so to the left looks like uh, another gun tub, and I think what we're looking at here is um, is kind of uh, the the crumpled edge of the flight deck, which is uh, caved in, um, and is because because the middle part of it I think collapsed. Um, so that's what we're looking at here. That that uh, flatter part up top is uh, the very edge of the flight deck. I'm fairly certain. And this here is a anti-aircraft gun tub. And then we're looking across the ship, inboard. Is that the, the edge? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, with the collapse, so dramatic. There's incredible pause here, looking at it. I find the gun tubs are really one of the places where they're these absolutely enormous ships that we've created have some have some human scale where you could imagine, you know, the edge of a gun tub almost like a guardrail. Is that is that right that those gun tubs would be waist high? Or uh, might they yeah, be higher? Kinda like that, yeah. Are we close to the bow, Mike? Uh, we're getting there. We're not close to it, though. Um, there's, there's still quite a bit of ways, I think. 40, 40 meters or so. Okay. Sonar. Actually, so that um, circular thing up there and these gun tubs, I think we might actually be, I think this actually might be the top of the hangar deck even, and it's collapsed even further inward and the flight deck was above this. Just a theory. Yeah, and John Parshall, who's been joining us here in the chat, is confirming on the armament, the configuration of the gun tubs and the large gap that we just passed. And that smaller gun and davit uh, from the small boat matched the plans for the Akagi. Thanks, John. And just want to check if uh, either Drew, Nakifume, or Randy, if you're online, would love to hear from you. eight meters away or so, according to uh, our collision avoidance sonar. I'm going to drop down.
Nautilus Shoreside, as you drop down, one thing that may be the case here is that the explosive damage would have taken out the entire forward area of the, uh, not only the flight deck, but even portions of the hangar. Um, what will be interesting to see is, you know, the cruiser bow itself, how much of that has survived, if it has survived, and it may extend based on where we believe we are on the, and looking at the plans, we should have about another 80 meters of hull past the, uh, past the area that we are at now. And so whatever we're seeing in the sonar could be just the mangled remains of what had been the hangar and the flight deck. Yeah, Roger that, Jim. I'm, I'm looking at the plans right now. I think I know exactly where we are. It's, there was, um, there's kind of like three levels of, of anti-aircraft gun and I, um, and then there's like a small, that small circular thing that we saw above was, um, so it looks to be right where the bow starts to taper, I think. And I think that the, I don't think we're looking at flight deck. I think we're looking at hangar deck. I think the flight deck is completely gone. Yeah, we would, we would concur. And Phil is just pointing out that we are basically in the area of that hit. The, the, of what? The, the hit, the, first, the bomb. Oh. That, uh. No, that was, that was, um, that was aft. That was aft of the stack. There was a near miss off the bow. There's a near miss off the bow, Mike. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a record of that. Strange. It's going to uh, range up here, Mike, and uh, back up to 20 meter division. Ranges. Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, I'm going to range up on the uh, sonar here now that we're done at the mud line. So we're back up to 20 meters per division or 100 meter range on the sonar. Okay. So it looks like there's about uh, 50 meters on our to the right of us. Yeah, that makes sense. Getting uh, sonar returns. Could be just some debris there. That just could be the mud line disturbed uh, when a coggy landed. And uh, uh, Mike. Polar here, so we can let it Just uh, to clarify, mudline is where the wreck uh, touches the sediment bottom, right? Correct. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hans, I think we're right here. Can we go back up to the edge of the deck, please? Yeah, Roger, I'm just going to stand here once, so. Coming up. Yeah, so I think uh, it does mean that the stack is missing, which is, it's a shame. I wanted to see that. So Mike, you may have already talked about this when I was, we were getting situated. Did you talk about um, how the Akagi was damaged uh, compared to the others? Was the Akagi the one that had more of a, a direct hit that then exploded the ordnance on the ship? Uh, well, all, all four Japanese carriers had that happen. Or the three that were hit at, like in the same strike, that yeah. happened too. Yeah. Was that the question? Yeah, no, I was just rereading stuff last night and I, I couldn't remember. It seemed like one, um, a couple of the other ships had a lot more direct hits while one of them maybe only had one or two, but the, the parameters were set up so that just with the fuel and the ordnance and everything, it just, um, you know, just exploded. Yeah, Akagi only had one direct hit. There, oh, uh, there are yeah. quite a few that went off nearby in the water that, that did cause some shrapnel damage. Thanks, Mike. 
Lone partial just wanted to install that the hit came near the midship's elevator. Yep, right, right uh, aft of it, I believe. I think they found out later they also had a near miss at the stern that ended up jamming the rudder and uh, taking the maneuverability away from an aircraft carrier, you know, takes it out of the action. But yeah, I'm just, uh, for the main hit, it looks like that thousand pound bomb right at the stern edge of the, aft edge of the central elevator on deck. John's also come back just to remind us all that that hit, that one hit, started the fires that burned and burned for some time and led to subsequent explosions which wrecked the ship. As well, the near miss at the stern jammed the rudder. So, least damage with the initial hit, but that fire, the inability to prevent it, everything just burning, uh, aircraft being refueled ordnance, we're seeing the evidence of that all the way forward here as we look at flight deck that is blown out, badly damaged. That's a bit of a conundrum here, Mike. I'm not sure what you want to do. We're approximately 10 meters from the main hole there, but uh, there's no sonar targets in front of us. So kind of, you all, you can see the sonar for yourself. I don't know if you want to move back in to be over or move along lower down where we have a target, where we have visual. Sir, I'm not sure. What's the question? Um, we're still about 10 meters from the, uh, from the vessel, as you can see on the left there, but then it kind of abruptly uh, stops the sonar returns like we're... Um, so if we drop back down, we'll have visibility and we can continue to move um, at 200 along the, uh, along the hole there. Stand by. Uh, yeah, are you saying like so we came back up is there is there not more wreck up here or I'm, I'm confused as to where we were following along the, the deck edge yeah we were just closer in so you can see on the left of the sonar it's kind of a straight line and then it disappears so yeah. it's like the like you say the flight deck is is missing there all right well yeah let's drop down and, and reacquire right it Pretty well. Uh, you can see some things hanging out quite a ways there. Gives you a little uh, better idea as we come back down to. 10 meters there. So there's some debris hanging out to our right side, about 10 meters away. Uh, we can move forward and require the wreck from above, or we can uh, continue to move laterally along it down here. Um, I mean, I'd like to uh, continue documenting the, f the deck edge as we were, but if there's stuff sticking out, we don't want to get too close. Yeah, I think it would be safer where we were above, but closer again so we can look down on it. Sure. So you can kind of see the basic line of the hole there. Yep. 20 meters away. But there's a whole bunch of debris hanging out 10 meters there. Yep. Yeah. 
I'm assuming that's uh, biology hanging down yeah, there. Yes, so maybe come up, move forward, and then continue on to the right. Yeah. So uh, let's take 10 meters, or let's take that 20 meters back, uh, 110. Yeah, we'll get back back up close and friendly with it. Bridge nav. It's a uh, ROV trap hanging out there, so. Can we please step two zero meters with the bearing of one one zero? Yes, please. Thank you. Did we want to go 20 meters or 10? Uh, we stepped away 20 meters. Yeah, I think we only wanted to go 10 forward, right? Uh, we can try 10 at first. 20 will put us back where we were. Oh, never mind. Go ahead, do that. I didn't realize we'd stepped completely away. You can see uh, Mia's track here. I don't know if you can see this screen. No. Oh, I see. Can you see that from back there? Yeah. You can also bring it up. So we did the two 30 meter moves at 200. Uh, we stepped away 10 meters, then we did another 30 meters at 200, then we did two 10 meter steps away to drop, to get safe enough to drop down there. So we're going to take this uh, 20 meters back and yeah. put us back on, on this uh, north-south line that we were on. Yeah, please do. Should put us back where we started before we stepped away. Yeah, that works. Thank you. <laughs> but you're right, we might step back that 10 again, but I, I think we want to be above all this debris here, so if we're not above it, you won't be able to see a lot. And um, just to address some questions in the chat about the bobbing <coughs> of the cameras. So um, we are in a very delicate operation right now. Typically we have Atalanta working together with Hercules, but at these steps, Hercules is not rated um, for deeper than 4,000 meters. So we are using Atalanta uh, by itself currently, and it is, um, a little bit of a process to move at Atalanta um, and move the ship at the same time, and there are waves affecting the movement from above. We can turn that fan down a little bit. I'll turn it to the left. That's good. You don't have to turn it way down just, just so it drops 20 dB or so. Yeah, Karen, an incredible analogy to think about to. that the ship is three miles above the ship, uh, above um, Akagi right now, connected with um, just a thin cable point. We call it the 6.8 cable because it's 0.68 of an inch. So um, all of that connectivity, bringing us these images, um, transmitting the electricity down to, to power the lights and the cameras, um, all there. So you can think about your you know, helicopter holding an extremely thin line with a a camera at the base um, over three miles. We were all safely sitting above um, Akagi, but able to see these images and share in these moments of um, our first views here and also share them with people all around the world. So we're so honored to have folks watching. If you're watching on YouTube, we encourage you to come over and check out nautiluslive.org where you can send in questions for our team, talk with the experts, learn about the folks that are uh, interpreting and sharing their knowledge with you. Uh, but right now, 
in addition to being honored to, to be joined by viewers in Japan and the United States, uh, we also have viewers in Canada and Denmark, um, in India, in Norway, Poland, Venezuela, Germany, um, across the Pacific in Palau and in Guam, in Sweden, um, Australia, New Zealand. Send in a note, where are you watching from? What are your impressions and reactions? You know, we are just so honored to be in this place uh, to learn from it, to uh, uplift and remember the sacrifice and the service of so many young men in this time and uh, to be happy to look forward at this time where as collaborators, as colleagues, as uh, friendly and partner nations, we can do things like learn and care for our ocean together uh, rather than the way that we were relating um, at the time eight decades ago. And uh, just so you know, the ship's about settled in. So we're just waiting on that Atalanta to, to catch up. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the update, Mia. No worries. I know it can be, um, you know, we're sitting on the edge of our seats as we're waiting for Atalanta to catch up, eager to see what we can find. We had a question about um, the staff and whether there are historians involved. So yes, we have a, um, a team of marine archaeologists um, working offshore and on the, or sorry, onshore and on the ship EV Nautilus, uh, working together to share their knowledge and um, view this uh, wreck at the same time and get a better idea of what uh, we are observing. If you'd like more information about um, those involved in this very collaborative project, uh, you can find their all of their um, profiles on nautiluslive.org right under the live feed. Um, we have colleagues from different universities, um, University of Maryland, University of Hawaii, um, Tokai University. Um, uh, we also have partners from the National Park Service, Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument, the NOAA Office of Exploration, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Um, so uh, feel free to uh, find out more about this amazing team on the website. And if you'd like uh, to see some highlights from yesterday's dive um, on the USS Yorktown, feel free to also check out uh, our social media pages for some photos and uh, more information. No, we're still moving in. I think they, maybe the top of the hull is um, buckled inwards here, it looks like. Or at least the image on the son sonar is. And for viewers that were asking also for some uh, cultural context, we are looking at what we believe to be um, a Kagi 
from the Battle of Midway. Um, this is a very important uh, historical moment and monument, and we hope to learn about this wreck to better understand um, the damage and survey its archaeological con condition, as well as uh, understand deep sea reefs and um, bring together all these experts and also honor and pay tribute to all the lives that were lost at this battle. And the area we are in is Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument, which is a very sacred uh, place for the native Hawaiians as well. Um, the northwestern Hawaiian Islands are the Aina Akua, the sacred elder Kapuna Islands of um, the native Hawaiians. And the namesake uh, Papahanaumoku Akea comes from um, Papahanaumoku is considered a motherly figure personified by the earth and all things that give birth, including plants, animals, humans, and even one's consciousness. And Wakea is a father figure personified as an expanse <clears throat> or a greater space such as the sky. And those two um, are very honored and highly recognized as the ancestors of the native Hawaiian people, uh, which gave rise to this name for the Marine National Monument. Uh, you can also learn more about uh, the monument uh, on their page with uh, lots more detail about the history, uh, the different islands that mm -hmm. compose the area, um, archaeological findings there. Um, there's a lot of uh, rich cultural heritage. And it looks like we are getting some new viewers that are asking um, what we are looking at. And we currently um, are moving our ROV, our remotely operated vehicle, Atalanta, to get a better view of uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Akagi. So for more uh, context on that, it was built in the 1920s um, and sailed with a crew of about 1,600 servicemen. It was the flagship for Japan's first air fleet. And uh, during the battle, a dive bomber landed a 1,000 pound bomb on the aft edge of the middle airplane elevator. Uh, it went through the flight deck to the upper hangar and detonated uh, in the midst of the fully armed and fueled torpedo bombers. Um, there was uh, raging fires that burned aboard and uh, later on destroyers Arashi Hagi Haji Kaze, Mai Kaze, and Nowaki each fired one torpedo into the former flagship and uh, sank it bow first. So in the past, in 2019, a team from Vulcan Inc. Okay, and the US Navy um, three zero, conducted some high resolution surveys and uh, right. were able to estimate the um, location of Akagi, and um, today we have been um, just starting our dive for the past several hours, uh, getting a look of what we believe is uh, the wreck. So thank you so much for joining us, whether you're on you YouTube or our page. Uh, please feel free to continue to send in your questions, and we'll provide an more information as we can. Now we're mo we moving now. Yeah, we're just calling in a 30-meter move along the... Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt your great commentary. Yeah, I just called in a 3-0 step at a 2-0-0 bearing. It should move us along the uh, edge of the structure here. Okay. I'm 
given Atalanta full beans to lateral back in. Get tired of waiting for the ship. Seems to be working. <laughs> so we seem to have yeah. uh, the five to ten meter capability to lateral the vehicle left or right. Yeah, Roger that. Whether it stays there or not, I don't I can't guarantee, but this is basically back where we were going 200 ish there. Be interesting to see if it swings back out. Yeah, so I think we're looking at um, collapse of the hangar deck. I think the flight deck above is completely gone. And yeah. we're looking at some of the supporting struts that held up the flight deck. And we're moving, we're pretty, we're probably maybe 30 or 40 meters, I would say, from the from the bow. Maybe a little more. Sonar agrees. Yeah. You know, Dan, the superstructure beneath the flight deck here narrows quite a bit, too, so maybe that explains some of that curvature that we saw as the side of the vessel fell away from us. Yeah, where it's... When we dropped down, it we seemed to acquire it, and when we came up, it, it kind of went away. You're saying the hole curves into a point. It narrows. Yeah. Well, it's also possible. So the flight deck went extended quite a bit a, a ways over the bow, uh, and there wasn't superstructure between them. So we might, that might explain why we might have, or we're soon coming up to a place where there wasn't much between the hull and the um, the flight deck for a couple of deck levels. Yeah, basically, yeah. Uh Well, that's interesting. When I took off the laterals, it did swing back. Yeah. And just because uh, it seems like we have a lot of new viewers, um, Micro Hans, we are expecting not to see that much of the flight deck, right, because of the damage? Yeah, um, most of the flight deck is either uh, destroyed in the explosion or was burned away later on. This would have also been a very open section of the overhang forward on the ship. And the descent through the water column, you know, this would have caught a lot of pressure. So, yeah, um, the next thing below us, once we get to the forward section, is the forward deck, which is some three or four stories down from the flight deck. Could you uh, add on to that, clarify um, maybe how many layers or floors there were in this ship? Originally, as built, there were multiple flight decks, which is a very odd thing to conceive of, and I, I only recently learned more about it myself. But as aircraft got bigger and heavier, they could no longer launch from underneath the main flight deck. So they turned those multiple flight decks, those stacked flight decks, multi-layered, into two hangars beneath the main flight deck on top. So one main flight deck on top, then the next two decks down are two hangars, one on top of each other, running the full length enclosed hangars. And beneath that, there would have been a couple decks for um, storage of aircraft, storage of ammunition, etc. And then beneath that, only then you get down to the lower part of the ship and the large boilers and engine room. So as the Akagi was built on top of a battle cruiser hull, the top flight deck, and then in the final configuration, the only flight deck, the main flight deck, is really quite high above the original cruiser hull's deck. Wow, so many, many floors. Multiple decks. 
Just so you know, science, um, we have about three meters left in the ship movement, maybe a little less. Um, so after this, uh, we'll just need to wait for Atalanta to catch up. Okay, why don't we, um, since we seem to have trouble following the deck edge here, why don't we um, go down and follow the hull to get to the bow? I think that might tell us more about why um, we're... Um, yeah, I don't want to drop down along there. There's too much debris on the on the sonar. Uh, we can move, drop down, move, drop down. But okay. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to uh, move down the other. It's just too many sonar targets and limited visibility. So if I turn to look for visual targets to avoid, you won't see any of the hole. And if I'm looking at the hole, we'll we're going to swing into something that's hanging out there. And so is this thing we're looking at a vertical wall or is it leaning away from us? This is the what's this is a flat here. I've just um, I'm laterally to the left right now to get around that pillar as we move towards the bow. Yeah, I guess I'm just having trouble seeing if the, what part of the ship we're on. Is this a flat thing that we're over and looking down? Yeah. OK. Hmm. So the, the edge of the deck is behind us or below us? To the right of us. That pillar that you mentioned is just to the right. OK. Mike? Yeah. I think, you know, what sense is here is that this all of this deck is what blew out and sort of folded over. And on the sonar, as we've been looking at it, there's a big flap of this that basically gets folded over and lays on top of the cruiser hull. As you continue to move forward, you're ultimately going to get past this, and there will be that drop that will take you down to the cruiser hull deck level. Uh, and if you're you know, 10, 20 meters away, then you'd have countered. I, my sense is you're getting closer to that edge. You don't need to go all the way down to the mud, but if you can get down there and acquire the, the hull of the, the cruiser bow and move forward on that without having to go all the way to the bottom, uh, hopefully there wouldn't, there shouldn't be any other debris in that area, but there were the uprights that supported this deck. What we don't know is how much of that is left and the sonar record from the discovery doesn't really tell us that other than we can see this big flap of deck in it. Yeah, so, you, can, you can see up ahead in the sonar there where the kind of the hole. Yeah. Just coming into visibility so, yeah. now. There. Uh, yeah, in the upper right area. Yeah. So you, so you're looking, f you're looking forward parallel to the. Correct. I'm looking north on the. Uh, along the edge. Well, you're looking we... south. Oh, sorry, looking south. Okay. Can we can we look back at the at the wreck? So we're so we're over the wreck then. Stand by. Okay, I see. Um, so, so we're directly over part of the wreck. Can, yes. Can we move backwards so that we're not, so that we can see the edge of the edge of the wreck? Roger. I'll see if I can slide back out a bit. We just wanted to make sure we cleared those, the things that were jutting out on the right side. Yeah, understood. Um, but we are we are trying to follow the edge of the deck so that we know where we are on the ship. Yeah, the edge disappeared. So we, uh, but we're on the original line that we were on.
how much. Roger. Yeah. Yeah, and clear to adjust heading, 15 degrees north. And I already know I <clears throat> already thanked our navigation and ROV uh, team for their amazing work, but I just wanted to share that our viewers are also noting their appreciation and um, are very impressed as well. So they're giving you some shout out. So again, thank you for your patient and careful work. And you're doing a great job as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Our audience is, uh, is really uh, a wonderful community offering lots of questions. So thank you for everyone exploring with us. Um, Hans, do you think you could give a uh, explanation for some of our viewers who may not be as familiar with the battle? Just um, explaining the role of the carriers versus the destroyers you mentioned, or cruisers? Sure, I could I could give it a shot. Uh, something that was you know real something that really emerged with the period in the 1930s, 1940s, and World War II was the importance of naval aviation and the ability for naval aircraft to project power and, and make an attack, you know, at a greater distance uh, and rather do that from doing that from land bases. They now had the ability to launch from aircraft carriers. And this is really only something that developed from the early 1910s, 1920s. And it was not too many years before this that naval aviation meant biplanes, well, two, yeah. two, two winged planes and, you know, seaplanes, flying boats. So the technology and the, the, uh, the tactical use developed very quickly. And rather than having a f battle as foreseen previously, between surface ships firing their, their guns at each other, as in battleships lining up and, and firing guns at other surface ships, warfare in the Pacific, naval warfare quickly became one of aircraft carriers and squadrons being launched to find enemy vessels. The Coral Sea was an engagement that featured naval aviation uh, almost exclusively, and the battle at Midway, of course, took place solely between squadrons of naval aircraft. The surface ships never targeted each, each other, never got in sight of each other. So the aircraft carrier gained prominence and soon became the center of the task force or the group. And that meant that other ships, cruisers and destroyers, had the important role of escorting the, air, the aircraft carrier fleet and protecting the aircraft carrier from incoming aircraft rather than firing their their guns at other ships. So each carrier sailed with a number of escort vessels, screening vessels, oh. to help prevent that. And each of these carriers that we're looking at, of course, as we've seen, all right, 10 meters carried anti-aircraft guns mm -hmm. all around the perimeter. Wow, so the... <coughs> 10 meters, 290. The cruisers and destroyers were helping to protect the aircraft carrier from um, other aircraft, basically, enemy aircraft. Correct. They're screen screening vessels. Gotcha. And was there anything they could do when, when these enemy aircraft are in the area, they're, they're dropping bombs from above, but also torpedoes, correct? Is there a different tactic for addressing those different kinds of, um, I guess, damage? Fighter aircraft. Fighter aircraft. So there were several types of aircraft carried, tor torpedo bombers and uh, dive bombers or uh, glide bombers, and then fighter aircraft, kind of three basic divisions of roles. And torpedo planes, dive bomber aircraft, and other types were meant to attack vessels, but the fighters escorted 
those squadrons on their way to protect them from other being shot down by other fighters at the same time as screening vessels and aircraft carriers were firing their own anti-aircraft weapons. Wow, there's so much going on at the same time. And like you said, um, it the battle was over a huge, massive ocean area. Um, fight They were fighting at ranges of 50 to 150 miles apart, so they didn't really see each other um, while they were uh, fighting with aircraft and different vessels. That's correct. They relied on reports from scout aircraft, from patrol aircraft, and it was very much a game of, of hide and seek, of locating the enemy fleets and particularly locating the aircraft carriers. If a scout plane sighted a destroyer or a cruiser, that's not going to be the primary target necessarily. Oh. They wanted to know where the carriers were, so they would follow that ship back to the, the group that it was part of. Wow. So um, was scouting for information a very important role? Like what percentage of aircraft were used just for scouting versus for, you know, going out for um, damaging a certain area? Or are those just completely separate sequences in an event? Well, I think you could say, and you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm not a military expert or aviation <laughs> person <laughs> yeah. myself, but you know, it takes one plane to scout uh, mm -hmm. a, a route or a course Whereas if you're launching an attack, you want as many attack planes as possible in a group. Right. So often the scout planes or the long range patrol bombers like a PBY mm -hmm. would be sent out in different directions mm. on their own. Wow, on their own, okay. Thank you, Hans, for starting us off. I wonder if um, any of our team ashore or our colleagues in Japan would like to add anything about the significance of those different tactics. Yes, please. Hi, Dr. Tirbalg. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so um, the Akagi was um, in Ali, it was explained that um, the largest uh, the aircraft carrier that ever built um, in Japan and um, where we what we seen is the uh, uh, modified version of Akagi, which had, uh, which had a, a single deck and um, hangar could have uh, 91 airplanes um, inside. So um, the original idea of the Akagi, its role was um, the flagship of 88 fleet. Um, plan originally, and then um, for the midway, it was uh, by the time of the midway, it was converted as um, largest um, aircraft carrier. Then the Nagumo intended to. Um, Attack the uh, Midway Islands. Now, already, um, the Akagi was engaged in the battles in the Pacific. Um, himself um, in Pearl Harbor, Labau, and Port Darwin attack in Australia. And uh, Akagi, uh, by the time of the Midway, um, um, Uh, had a battle with um, Hamis, uh, the British uh, aircraft carrier, and also um, Akagi got successfully sunken two British cruisers. Um, by the time, however, the um, 
Akagi didn't have an appropriate uh, ladder to catch up air raid attack. And that was pretty key uh, in the midway battles. And um, Akagi in the end was uh, got being sunken um, by air raid and also finally the 12 people attack the uh, from Japanese side, attack, got attack, duck, and get to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, June. Thank yes, you. and I would like to emphasize it. The loss of the Akagi, uh, 267 people are lost and the um, majority of them were in the uh, 20s. And there was a huge loss, uh, of course, uh, during the battle. And um, as Mike explained earlier, the, uh, the uh, major cause of the, uh, the, um, the sunken event was the Akagi uh, carried a number of torpedoes in during the hunger and um, that was very uh, large, 12 uh, pedals, uh, called a 91 type 12, uh, 12 pedal. The length, the size of the 12 pedal was quite large. That was uh, 100, uh, 542 meter long, and uh, they were in the uh, storage positions. Uh, they are out from the storage uh, positions. And, and so uh, huge um, explosions happens in Akagi during the battles. Yes. So, um, yep. Thank you, June. Mm -hmm. I think we're certainly seeing some evidence of those huge explosions um, as we look to understand the flight deck, you know, seeing just those remnants, that little, little edge of wooden deck that we saw earlier and the rest collapsed in. Thank you so much for sharing, June. June, we did have a question earlier I, that I don't know if we got an answer to. Uh, do you know what type of wood the uh, flight decks were constructed of in Japan at the time? We were learning yesterday about uh, Douglas fir decks on uh, the USS Yorktown, and we're curious about this construction. Uh, that's a very really good question, and um, well, I have some books and uh, references, but it didn't, uh, those references didn't particularly say about what type of wood were used for the deck. Um, well, I'll check, I'll check. Um, I don't have the information at this moment, so. No problem. Not on the short side. Go ahead, short side. So, as you can see, we are just moving past the edge of the flight deck where it was blown up and out, and we're looking down on the hull, the deck level of the cruiser hull. You see some bits there, you all, do you also see the hatch? Do you all notice the circular hatch? 290, we'll step away another 10. Roger that, shore side. Bridge nav. So, can so we as we continue to step away, we're gonna start, the hull should start to taper and move towards the bow. Well done. Yeah. Copy that where you are. We've stepped 10 meters away. We stepped 20 meters away and then 20 meters back in. And for some reason that brought us over the top of the wreck. So we stepped 10 away again. Now we're gonna step another 10 back. Uh, may maybe we're slightly off on the orientation of the wreck. I think, well... Because when I was looking at it, it looked like it was almost directly north-south. Yeah. 
maybe. That is a dramatic perspective of the height of the deck we had been following, the flight deck looking down at the forward deck of the original cruiser hull. Is that circular, um, is that a hatch with the, looks like a wheel on top? I'm not sure what that is, but the bits are on the left, bottom left, they're very clear. And that's, we're right at the edge of where the, um, the ship structure ends on these decks. And we're just looking at the bat, the front of the bow, uh, as it tapers. Yeah. So we were following along, uh, right. the edge up there and then. For some reason, we've on that last move uh, yeah. we stepped in. So I don't think our 200 is quite perpendicular to the right. I think we're looking at the front edge of the enclosed hangers. Short side concurs. You, that's where you are, and you can see both sides of the hull. You've got bollards as well and it looks like you have them on both sides roger we see the bits just an incredible view they uh akagi was originally built um, in the 1920s in service from 1927 and rebuilt in, from 1935 to 1938 which included the addition of these flight decks of, on top um, uh, that also um, later enlarged to a single flight deck and added the island superstructure. So see the ship, you know, going through multiple evolutions and this view where we're at right now was naturally before any of the battle damage, this large drop off from the flight deck back down to the original deck, er, the original um, bow structure below. Um, if you checked out our, on social media, our dive alert, an image of the Akagi doing flight operations in 1942 in April, just a few months before the Battle of Midway. And from that head-on perspective, you can really see that drop down. So I encourage you to check us out on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook, um, on Twitter or X. Uh, any of those platforms will be sharing images in addition to the live feeds uh, here. Not a short side. Go ahead. With, where we're at now, um, again, just looking at the sonar scale, we the question that we're going to have as we continue to move here is how much of the hangar has survived. So some of this is flight deck, but some of this also appears to be, it potentially could be the remains of hangar and that hangar bulkhead. Uh, Trying to sort that out is also something of some interest. As well, at this point, we're not seeing any evidence of, but it may be that it's down lower on the deck, of the sockets or the mounts for the large beams that supported the flight deck as it projected out over the bow. Did you also see, and what we're wondering about is, did you see uh, any evidence of anchor chain or anything of that sort near the bow. We thought we caught a glimpse of it a second ago. Yeah, yeah we'll look when we get to the bow. We haven't quite got there yet. You're getting close. Yeah. I think you can kind of see in this view when um, we're all coordinating down here to move on, uh, along the ship and avoid Hitting obstacles, you can see uh, what we were passing on the, now it's on the left when we were trying to get around. Um, and just like if you're trying to, you know, work on your computer and you pull your cable, your cord, and it gets wrapped around a, you know, a table leg or something, uh, that's something we don't want to happen with Atalanta. We want everything to be clear. We don't want it to get stuck into anything so that we can keep moving forward. <laughs> 